So uh, today we're very fortunate to have uh, Laura Schaefer come all the way from Phoenix <laughs> to visit us. Um, Laura is uh, currently a postdoc at ASU, uh, working with the Psyche mission, among, mm -hmm. other the, among the other many things she's doing for research. Um, her research interests uh, include uh, core formation of rocky exoplanets to um, uh, mantle atmosphere interactions, the early Earth uh, atmosphere, ocean formation, uh, a variety of topics um, local to the solar system and beyond. Uh, prior to becoming a postdoc at ASU, uh, she was a PhD student at Harvard. She got her degree working with Dimitar Sasloff on uh, um, atmosphere mantle interaction stuff. I don't remember the mm -hmm. exact title. Um, and prior to that, uh, she spent almost a decade at Washington University as a researcher doing thermochemical model of a range of things from uh, IO um, volcanism to Venus's atmosphere and I think some stuff on Mars perhaps. So she has a wide variety of interests and mm -hmm. um, we probably have room for maybe one more. We had someone drop out um, at the last minute for dinner. So if you wanna join us, let me know. I think we know where we're going. It may be seafoody, uh, so if that helps. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew is an, has an idea for this. Um, anyway, uh, so Laura's going to talk about atmosphere mantle feedback and also um, with some, uh, perhaps some ast astrobiological implications uh, along the way. So uh, mm -hmm. without further ado, uh, let us start. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the problem of atmosphere and mantle feedbacks is a really big one in understanding atmospheric formation and evolution on rocky planets. Uh, and so for the last couple of years, I've been sort of focusing on one particular aspect of it, which is the mantle oxidation state. Um, so here's a quick outline of where I'm going to go with this talk. So I'm going to first talk a little bit about the volatiles that are in the mantle. And um, so this is why we care, of course, about atmosphere and mantle feedbacks is because the mantle can be a pretty significant reservoir for um, many of the volatile elements that make up the present day atmosphere. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the, the range of co compositions you would get for outgassed atmospheres from various planetary materials that formed in the solar nebula. And then I'll talk about a couple of processes that can change the oxidation state of both the atmosphere and the mantle. Um, the first one is sort of an atmosphere dominated process and the second one is more dominated by the silicate and metal interaction in the magma ocean interior. So here's um, a little overview of water in the Earth's mantle. So for this talk, for um, I said volatiles, I'm really going to focus on water. Um, water is actually pretty soluble in silicates that we originally thought were were pretty anhydrous, so minerals that don't have water in their chemical structure, like olivine, which is a Mg2SiO4. So this figure here on the top left is showing the solubility of water in olivine as a function of depth within the Earth's mantle. So you can see that as we go up to higher pressures, we can get significant abundances of water um, going into those minerals. The figure over here on the left is showing the water storage capacity of the mantle. So this is just if you stuffed as much water into the mantle as you could, uh, where would it be located? So you can see the crust has a pretty high water storage capacity because you can make hydrated minerals like serpentine. Um, the upper mantle curve is sort of following this solubility curve from olivine, so it's increasing as a function of pressure. And then when we get to this transition zone region, uh, this is where we have some high pressure polymorphs of olivine called wadsleyite and ringwoodite that are really happy to hold on to a few weight percent of water. So they can be extremely water rich. Now we think the lower mantle, which um, is quite large, uh, probably has a pretty low storage capacity because the major mineral is bridgmanite, um, and it doesn't, it's, it's not very happy to hold on to water. And then you can see down here, the core could have a significant amount of hydrogen, um, but we don't really have a lot of constraints on, on how much that might be. Um, and so I'm actually just not gonna talk about the core for the rest of the talk. Um, but over here in this table, 
I'm showing some estimates of exactly how much water we think that there is in the mantle. So if the water was fully saturated and followed this figure over here on the left, then we would expect something like four times the amount of water that is on the surface of the Earth today. And we think, based on looking at melts from uh, mid-ocean ridge basalts and ocean island basalts, maybe it's more like half uh, an ocean mass to maybe one and a half times the ocean mass on the surface. But in any case, the amount of water within the mantle is at least comparable to the amount that's on the surface today. So you can see that exchanging water between these reservoirs over geologic time is going to be important for the evolution of the planet. Water can also influence the material properties of the mantle. The figure on the left is showing how water influences the melting curve of um, mantle minerals. So you can see the dry uh, peridotite is shown here in this dark blue line. So this is temperature on the x-axis and pressure, so depth within the interior uh, on the y-axis. You can see that as we add water into the peridotite, the melting temperature is decreasing pretty significantly. So if we saturate the peridotite in water at 8 GPA, we can drop the melting temperature by almost 800 degrees. So that's a pretty significant effect. Um, water is also going to influence the viscosity of silicate minerals. This is the measured viscosity for dry olivine, is shown in this top curve here. This is viscosity as a function of temperature. And if you add water, we are going to decrease the viscosity of the system. And at 1500 Kelvin, this is something like four orders of magnitude decrease in the olivine viscosity. So the viscosity is going to control the rate at which the mantle convex. So the more water you add into your interior, the faster the mantle is going to convect and cool off. So you can see that, that having volatiles in the interior can significantly affect your melting, your convection, and that's going to influence the rate at which volatiles can be exchanged between the atmosphere and the interior. Um, the volatiles are also very highly soluble in silicate melts as well as the minerals themselves. This is um, a figure showing the solubility of wa water within a basalt and a rhyolite. Um, that's the curves here um, as a function of pressure, and this is the abundance of water in those melts. So you can see we can, we're getting up to 40 to 50 percent water within these, within these melts at higher pressures. Um, the solubility limit is given by this equation here, and uh, we use this kind of uh, solubility within magma ocean models to try to understand the, the um, exchange of water between the atmosphere and the interior. Now, the solubility of uh, water and other volatiles within the melts is also a function of the redox state or the oxidation state of the melt. Um, so on the x-axis, of this figure over here, we have the oxygen fugacity relative to iron vostite. And if you don't know what that means, I'm going to explain it on the next slide. But the important part is over on the left is a reduced or low oxygen system. On the right is an oxidized or high oxygen system. And so you can see how that is influencing the, the speciation of volatiles within the melt phase. Um, for carbon at low oxygen fugacities, it's dominantly in methane, and then it transitions into CO forms, and then carbonate at higher oxygen fugacities. Um, and then we have molecular hydrogen versus water is shown in this figure over here on the right. Um, this is showing the abundance of hydrogen in the magma on the x-axis, and the relative abundance of hydrogen H2 to H2O on the y-axis. And the various curves are at different oxygen fugacities. So the blue one is a lower oxygen fugacity than the black one down here. So as we go to lower oxygen fugacities, um, hydrogen is going to be found more in H2 than in H2O. And so that influences the composition of gases that might exhale from this melt. Um, so just a quick primer for anybody not familiar with the concept of oxygen fugacity. 
Um, fugacity is just sort of a partial pressure, but if you're talking about a solid system, of course, we're not measuring a gas pressure. Uh, it's more of a proxy for the uh, availability of free oxygen to react with elements that have various valent states. So in a silicate system, the dominant element that has multiple valent states is iron. So this figure over here on the right is, the, is a phase diagram for iron oxygen system. And the x-axis is temperature, the y-axis is the logarithm of the oxygen fugacity. So the different phases are shown in these different fields. So at the lowest oxygen fugacity, we have metallic iron. Um, as we go up to higher oxygen fugacities, we get Fe2 plus in vustite, and then at the highest end, we have Fe3 plus in hematite, with 2 plus and 3 plus being mixed in magnetite. So iron vustite, each of these lines is a reaction, and iron vustite is just a, a convenient reference point in oxygen fugacity space. So I'll talk about things relative to iron vustite. So iron vustite plus two is up here and iron vustite minus two is down there. And in a melt system where you have volatiles present, the oxygen fugacity will be buffered by the melt. Um, so that is going to control this phase here in these reactions. And if we know what that oxygen fugacity is, then we know what the relative abundances of certain gases or, or volatiles within the melt will be. So we can estimate the abundances of water to H2, for instance, um, in an outgassed atmosphere based on the oxygen fugacity. Um, the, here I'm just showing uh, the speciation again relative to temperature and oxygen fugacity for these two for carbon and, and hydrogen. So if we're looking at the carbon system for oxygen fugacities below iron vustite plus one, carbon monoxide is going to be the dominant gas. And at anything above that, it's going to be CO2. Similarly for hydrogen, if we're below iron vustite, H2 is the dominant gas, water is the dominant gas above that. So now I'm gonna move on and talk about the composition of outgassed atmospheres uh, that we have modeled using various proxies from solar nebular materials. And here we're looking at meteorites that have survived um, relatively unprocessed from the solar nebula. This figure here is showing various kinds of chondritic meteorites um, on another measurement of oxidation state. So the y-axis is the uh, relative abundance of iron in reduced phases, so in metals and sulfides, and the x-axis is iron in oxidized phase, so in the silicate. So everything that's over on the left side of the plot is reduced, everything on the right side of the plot is oxidized. So we, you can see that we have a range of materials of various oxidation states that were produced in the solar nebula. Uh, Instatite chondrites, um, you can see here, contain a fair amount of metal. That's all the shiny white grains in this image. And that has a lot of sulfides and uh, the dominant silicate mineral is instatite, of course. Um, the ordinary chondrites have a little bit less metal. So you can see this vein of metal here, but you can see it's, it's definitely less metal than the instatite chondrite. And it has some olivine and orthopyroxene as the dominant silicate minerals. And then we have carbonaceous chondrites, which are the most oxidized materials. And these contain a lot of uh, silicates. They don't contain very much metal at all. Um, and they contain a lot of volatiles and, and uh, a lot of hydrated silicates. So these oxidized materials tend to be much more volatile rich than the reduced materials. So what uh, we did was take bulk compositions for these meteorites and then calculate the composition of atmospheres you would get if you built a little planet out of only that material. And that's what's shown in these two figures here. So the temperature is on the x-axis and the y-axis here are the relative abundances of the gases uh, in the outgassed uh, atmosphere. So the, the material on the left is a carbonaceous chondrite and the material on the right is an ordinary chondrite. And so this is a high oxygen fugacity and a low oxygen fugacity. And you can see our dominant gases for the 
oxidized material or water and CO2. Um, but we do have some amount of methane peaking up here at lower temperatures. And then for the reduced material, at high temperatures, it's H2 and CO again. Um, but at lower temperatures, we get a lot, of, a lot more methane than we do in the oxidized material. Now, we wanted to look at what happens if you mix these kinds of materials and how the oxidation state of the outgassed atmosphere would change uh, as you mix these materials that we think that, that uh, are good proxies for material that was around when the Earth and the other planets were assembled. So we looked at some mixtures of these, of these different meteorite types. So what I'm showing in this figure here is mixtures of different meteorite types with the carbonaceous chondrite from that previous slide. And the y-axis here is the oxygen fugacity relative to that iron vostite buffer. And I'm mixing this carbonaceous chondrite with a CV chondrite, uh, which has a similar oxygen fugacity. So you can see it's a pretty flat curve here. And then with the ordinary and an instatite chondrite, and this blue curve up here is a eukrite. This is um, a differentiated basaltic achondrite that we think came from Vesta. So you can see that the ordinary and the instatite chondrites, they st are starting off at a pretty low oxygen fugacity. Uh, as I showed in that previous slide, and they're, they have a pretty flat oxygen fugacity as you start to add carbonaceous material. And it's not until you get up to about 30 to 40 percent of this carbonaceous material that you start to increase the oxygen fugacity. And what's happening here is because those meteorites contain a lot of metal, you have to exhaust the metal by oxidizing it with all the water you're adding in the carbonaceous chondrite. Um, and so what's happening here is that we still have metal present, and it's buffering the oxygen fugacity of the system. And once we have fully oxidized it, or we have enough water to fully oxidize it, then you can start to get this linear increase here. Now, the eukrite, in contrast, also starts off at a pretty low oxygen fugacity, but it contains very little metal, and it also is very volatile poor. So, um, you have to add only a very little amount of the carbonaceous material in order to influence the oxidation state of this differentiated silicate material. So uh, from these calculations, we can see that it's, it's actually kind of difficult to predict what, just based on the bulk composition, what the oxygen fugacity of a system is going to be. So you really need to um, try to understand the chemistry that is going on as you're assembling a planet, how much water is going into oxidizing the metal that's being delivered to your planet, for instance. Uh, and if you have a previously differentiated body, then adding a little bit of volatile rich material to it can significantly change the oxidation state. So now I'm going to move on from talking about the composition and talk a little bit more about some of the processes going on during magma ocean stage, during planet formation, that might influence the oxidation state. So um, just a quick primer on magma oceans. I did give a talk here at Stewart last year where it was, was basically all about magma oceans. Um, but this time I'm fo focusing on the volatile rich ones. Um, so a magma ocean is just where we, the silicate mantle is either partially or completely molten. And usually um, this is in con contact with some kind of atmosphere. And because of the solubility of the volatiles within the liquid, there can be pretty rapid exchange between the atmosphere and the magma ocean. Now, in order to have a magma ocean, of course, the planet has to, be <coughs> has to be relatively hot. And so in the solar system, we think that this is restricted to pretty young planets. So we think uh, the Earth definitely went through a magma ocean stage, uh, at least one um, immediately after the giant impact that formed the moon. Um, there's a possibility that Mars went through a partial magma ocean stage very early in its history. Uh, the moon definitely went through a magma ocean period, um, and possibly Vesta as well. And for Venus, we, we don't really know. <laughs> we don't know nearly enough about Venus. Um, we've also found um, exoplanets that orbit their stars in about 20 hours, and these planets are so hot 
uh, on their day side just due to stellar insulation that uh, even without an atmosphere, the surface temperatures are hot enough to melt rocks. Some of them have surface temperatures um, above 2000 Kelvin. Uh, and for reference, uh, typical melting temperatures for basalts is around 1100 to 1200 Kelvin. So more, more than hot enough. And then we have planets that, that are further away and you might not think just based on their equilibrium temperature that they would have a magma ocean, but if they have a sufficiently thick enough atmosphere, the runaway greenhouse effect can easily drive a planet into a magma ocean state. Um, this is particularly a problem for planets in the habitable zones of, of M dwarf stars. This figure is showing the amount of runaway greenhouse flux that a planet on the inner edge of the habitable zone at the present day, so that's out here at five billion years, um, gets over its lifetime from its star. And this is for different stellar masses. So this, dark, this blue curve down here is for a sun-like star. So this is sort of a Venus analog. And you can see that it probably has a runaway greenhouse stage pretty early in its history, but it doesn't last very long. And then out here, after the star has evolved um, over a very long time. But if we look at this dark blue curve, this is for a, a star that is a tenth of a solar mass. Now these M dwarfs have a very extended pre-main sequence time, lifetime where they have this Kelvin Helm Helmholtz contraction going on. And so they're quite a bit hotter than they are during their main lifetime. And so a planet that is technically on the ha in the habitable zone today was perhaps within this runaway greenhouse stage for most of its lifetime. Now, this is a problem for a planet that has a lot of, uh, that has water, because again, if you put water into the atmosphere, it can uh, create a magma ocean due to the greenhouse effect. But now your water is also vulnerable to being, to escaping out the top of the atmosphere. Uh, this figure is showing a calculation of the amount of hydrogen lost from water on planets that are in the habitable zone of a range of stellar masses from very small M dwarfs up to K dwarf stars. Um, so the dashed lines here are highlighting the habitable zone distance at, at 5 billion years. And what this model is doing is they have a steam atmosphere, so that's a pure water atmosphere. And then they have uh, energy limited mass loss which is driven by XUV radiation from the star that is driving escape of hydrogen from the top of the atmosphere. But um, what's happening is the, hydro the, sorry, the water is being split up into hydrogen and oxygen. And since the hydrogen is lighter, it's being driven off. But some amount of oxygen can be drug along with that hydrogen. And so you can get a little bit of oxygen to escape as well. But for the most part, it's going to stick around in these habitable zone planets. And what happens is you can get a lot of oxygen to build up uh, over this long period of time. So this figure is showing, um, sorry, Ani, <laughs> it didn't explain the colors here. So this uh, planet starts off with one ocean mass of water. So that's the amount of water Earth has on the surface today. And these red areas here have lost all of that hydrogen. Uh, here is the similar plot for oxygen. Now red here is about 300 bars worth of oxygen. So these planets uh, around these small M dwarfs could potentially build up really massive atmospheres of oxygen uh, just due to this runaway greenhouse escape. Now one thing that this model didn't consider is whether oxygen would react with the planet's interior. And so that's something that I wanted to investigate. So I took a similar sort of model and I allowed oxygen to start reacting with the magma ocean. And I did it for this, this one planet, GJ1132b. It's orbiting an, a small M4 star. It is not in the habitable zone today, though. It is a little bit hotter in, in terms of equilibrium temperature than Venus, not quite as hot as Mercury. And it's about an Earth mass planet. Um, and so we took a magma ocean model for this planet. 
And so what we have is there is water being exchanged between the atmosphere and the magma ocean. And the magma ocean solidifies from the bottom up. And as it does so, water gets excluded from the solid material. Because if you remember those storage capacity terms, water doesn't really like to be in those lower mantle minerals very much. And so it'll get enriched in the melt, and that will increase the atmospheric pressure. And so eventually we'll get something like 75 to 80 percent of the water will get expelled from the magma ocean and put into the atmosphere. So we have XTV radiation from the star is now hitting the top of the atmosphere, photolyzing the water and driving this escape of hydrogen and, ox and some of the oxygen. Um, and so I'm going to show you some results uh, from, these, from this model, looking at two different XTV flux evolution models for the star, where we're just looking at sort of a high and low energy case, because we don't know very well how M dwarf stars XTV flux evolves over time. So I'm just taking two bracketing cases. Um, and then I'm going to show you uh, results that span a range of water abundances for the planet and iron oxide abundances in the mantle. And the iron oxide is the way that the mantle is absorbing the oxygen. So again, the iron is split up in the silicate between 2 plus and 3 plus. So the 3 plus can take up a lot more oxygen through this reaction here. Um, and uh, this reaction we have calibrated experimentally uh, in uh, looking at, at various natural silicates. And so it's sort of this complicated function of temperature, uh, pressure, and the composition of the silicate. So for this model, I'm using sort of an Earth-like composition. And we're starting off with all of the iron in the 2 plus state, because we think that's uh, that's the more natural form for iron in silicates, and that's where we predominantly find it in uh, the Earth and in solar system silicates. So this figure is showing the results at the end of 5 billion years of evolution for the atmospheric oxygen abundance. The figure on the left is showing the XUV, uh, sorry, the high XUV case, and the figure on the right is the low XUV case. And the color here is showing the pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere at the end of this model. And we have the initial water abundance on the y-axis and the iron oxide abundance in the mantle on the x-axis. And so what's happening is um, for this planet, because it is a little bit hotter than the, than the habitable zone planets, uh, for this high XUV case, the star is essentially stripping off the entire atmosphere. Uh, that includes both the water and the oxygen. Uh, for this lower XUV case, we have a little bit of oxygen left over, a few millibars, sort of comparable to the total atmospheric pressure of Mars today. Um, but there's no water left on this planet. Um, if we start off with uh, more moderate water abundances, so a few, few weight percent of water in the original planet, then we get sort of moderate oxygen atmospheres, but again, most of the hydrogen has been driven off, so there's no water left on these planets. And then at the highest end, uh, where these models are probably starting to break down at, at very high water percents, uh, the magma ocean actually lasts for the whole lifetime of the simulation. Um, there isn't enough XUV radiation to drive off enough water to allow the planet to cool below the melting point. Um, so there is still a, a remaining a very thick water atmosphere, um, but it's associated with pretty high oxygen abundances as well. Now, we, uh, I, I'm trying to talk here mostly about the interior of the planet, though, and how the, this process is affecting the mantle. So this is um, the amount of oxygen that is remaining um, in the planet at the end of these simulations. So again, water and iron oxide on the axes. And for these models, for these, this particular planet, um, there was only about 10% of the total oxygen that was produced uh, survived long enough to be absorbed into the mantle. But this does really depend pretty strongly on the oxygen escape rate. So if you shut off oxygen escape for this planet, um, then uh, these are the results. So we can get up to 90% of the oxygen that's produced can end up being absorbed into the mantle. 
And this line you can see here um, is related to the amount of oxygen produced in this water versus the um, sort of the ab absorbing capacity of the mantle to take up this amount of oxygen. So up here, we are just producing more oxygen than the mantle can actually store. So we tried to generalize this model a little bit um, to look at what kinds of planets would actually be most susceptible to oxygen buildup in their atmospheres. Um, because if, the, if these exoplanets are building up these massive oxygen atmospheres abiotically, then we probably don't want to go looking at them in search of biosignatures. And what we found was that this oxygen buildup is really most sensitive to a couple of parameters. And that's the orbit, the albedo, and the planetary mass. So the figure on the left, on this top left here, is for a one Earth mass planet in the habitable zone of an M dwarf. The color scale here is different, but it's still showing the oxygen abundance in the atmosphere. And again, water and iron are on the axes. So what you can see here is that we get this major oxygen buildup here for these low iron abundances, um, but really not for for any of these other cases. And as we go to higher planetary mass, we get less overall oxygen abundance. And the reason for that is sort of twofold. Uh, the first is being a larger planet, it has a higher gravity, and so there is less escape of hydrogen, and so less overall oxygen production. The other reason is that the mantle has a larger storage capacity just by sheer volume. And so it can absorb more of the oxygen. Albedo is uh, changing the albedo of this nominal model from 0.3 uh, up here on the left to 0.7 down here. You can see that we get significantly less oxygen buildup here. And again, this is because there is less overall oxygen production because more of the radiation from the star is being reflected rather than going into driving escape. And then we did just a check uh, to see whether adding CO2 into the atmosphere would influence this oxygen buildup at all. And we found that it didn't really have a huge effect. So the CO2 in this model is radiatively active, but it's not um, chemically reacting with the water in any way uh, in this particular model. Now we can apply a similar sort of model in the solar system, and this is some preliminary calculations that aren't really published yet. But looking at uh, Earth and Venus, we might want to compare how much, uh, how big of an influence could this have on the interiors of these two planets. So if we start off with an initial amount of water shown by this line here, um, and the y-axis now is showing the final abundance of water, you can see that for the Earth, starting off with the same amount of water as Venus, the Earth goes through less overall uh, atmospheric loss, uh, uh, Venus is going through a significant amount of loss, so it loses most of its initial water. The, uh, the effect on the oxidation state of the mantle is shown in this figure on the left. So what I'm showing here is as the mantle is progressively crystallizing, how much oxygen has been absorbed uh, and is being added into the mantle. So we start off with uh, essentially zero iron three plus, which is shown on the y-axis. And as we crystallize and oxygen is produced by water photolysis and hydrogen escape, the uh, iron three plus abundance is steadily increasing uh, because of this oxidation reaction. So the two red curves here, sorry, there's three. Uh, this one, it's a little hard to see. These, these two up here and this one down here are Venus and the blue curves are Earth. And for reference, this is the amount of iron three plus in the Earth's mantle today, roughly. So you can see that um, the bulk abundance of iron three plus is significantly lower than the um, value that the final stage of solidification is reaching. So uh, this particular mechanism uh, for this particular model can't really produce the iron three plus that we see in the Earth's mantle today. Um, but it could cause a significant oxidation of Venus's interior. 
Um, so this brings me to the next process that I want to talk about, and in particular focusing on the Earth's oxidation state. Um, so this is a figure that is showing measurements of proxies of the oxidation state over geologic time on the Earth. So the present day oxidation state is, sorry, this is relative to the uh, quartz phthalite magnetite buffer. So this is a different oxygen fugacity buffer than the iron vostite buffer. Iron vostite would be somewhere down here around minus four to minus five. So Earth today is significantly more oxidized than the iron vostite. At the present day, it's around this QFN buffer. And most measurements that we have of geologic material, uh, basically metamorphosed basalts, uh, going back to the Archean, suggests that the oxidation state hasn't changed very much over that time. Uh, this uh, band out here in yellow is measurements from proxies, redox proxies found in the mineral zircon uh, from ja the Jack Hills. So these are the oldest minerals that we have on Earth. Um, but we do not have any um, uh, solid rock or whole rock um, record going back past about 3,200 million years. And this bar down here at the bottom is from models of core formation on the Earth. So during planetary differentiation, iron, uh, iron metal was intimately mixed up with the mantle material. And as it separated, it uh, set the oxygen fugacity of the system somewhere at values slightly below the iron bustite buffer. So the question is, how did we get from core forming conditions up to present day conditions? And can we do that during the magma ocean on the Earth? There have been a couple of proposed mechanisms for how to change the oxidation state uh, during planet formation. So this is a simulation of core of, well, basically planetary formation and differentiation. Um, the figure on the left is showing a number of results from in-body simulations. So each of these little pie charts is a planet at the end of the simulation. And the colors are showing where in orbital space the material that ends up in these planets originally came from. So the brown is from the inner 0.5 to 1 AU. Uh, green is from 1.2 out to 3 AU, uh, and so forth. So each of these simulations sort of uh, matches the inner planet. So we have a, a, a Venus, an Earth, and a Mars-like proxy here. So what this paper did was to take these in-body simulations and assign compositions to the material from these different uh, orbital separations. And what they're particularly trying to match is the trace element abundances in the mantle and the oxidation state. Um, so they have assigned uh, the iron that is in these to either uh, to a certain fraction that is in metal versus in silicate initially. So in the inner region, uh, the metal, sorry, the iron is dominantly in metal, and then the outer region is dominantly oxidized. So as you start to accrete material that's coming from further out, you should naturally start to oxidize the planet. And this is what one of those simulations look like. They track about a dozen different elements uh, that are coming into the planet. Um, and again, try to match a lot of the trace elements like nickel and cobalt and copper. Um, what we're showing here is the iron oxide abundance and the oxygen fugacity as a function of the mass fraction of the earth that has accreted. So the bar up here is the present day iron oxide abundance in the mantle. And so you can see that in this, before this dashed line, all of the material is coming from the inner region of the solar nebula. And then out here, at, uh, past that dashed line, we're starting to accrete material from the outer solar nebula. And so we start to get more oxidized iron, and the, iron, uh, the oxygen fugacity increases. Now, what these models don't track is the iron 3 plus. So while the presence of metal will fix the oxygen fugacity of the mantle at somewhere around the iron vostite buffer. Um, here these simulations are going from iron vostite minus five up to iron vostite minus two at the end of core formation. 
Once that metal separates, it's really the ratio of 2 plus to 3 plus iron that's going to set the oxygen fugacity. And these simulations don't really track that. Um, so another possible oxidation mechanism for the Earth uh, is, again, sort of similar to what I presented in the, this, this last project, was looking at uh, atmospheric oxidation of the interior. Uh, these are calculations by Zach Sharp. Um, and what you can see here is we have, uh, excuse me, the amount of iron metal in a system as a function of time. And as, uh, and sorry, where is it? The, the oxygen fugacity is shown sort of by this curve here, or sorry, this curve down here. <laughs> as the uh, metallic iron is depleted, uh, once it disappears, you can have an increase in the oxygen fugacity of the system. And what he found, of course, was that uh, if you lose hydrogen from water, that's much more oxidative than just losing pure hydrogen. So if you have H in the form of H2, uh, losing H2 by itself is, is not going to increase the oxygen fugacity significantly. But uh, this atmospheric escape is really only effective once the metal has been separated from the system. Um, another possible uh, mechanism for oxidation of the interior, which is what I'm going to explore here, is uh, internal oxidation at high pressures. So this is a mechanism that has been suggested by um, Frost et al. in 2005 and then Wade and Wood um, in 2006. Um, and this is uh, the mineral in the lower mantle, bridgmanite, is typically made up of Mg to SiO4, sorry, MgSiO3. Um, but at high pressure, there is a lot of aluminum still there, and it needs somewhere, some kind of mineral phase to go into. So if we allow aluminum to go into the system, um, because it's a 3 plus and not a 2 plus or a 4 plus, it has to be balanced um, by an iron 3 plus atom. If there is no iron 3 plus present in the lower mantle, <coughs> you can create iron 3 plus through the disproportionation reaction. So what's happening is you take three atoms of iron 2 plus and you disproportionate those and you produce two, uh, two atoms of iron 3 plus and one atom of metallic iron. So all the charge is being held by those 3 plus atoms. <coughs> and the idea here is that you have a magma ocean and it starts to crystallize. It crystallizes from the bottom up. So you get perovskite forming. And that creates some iron 3 plus, And it also creates a little bit of metal. And then you go through another cycle of melting. So you remelt that. And that allows you to both separate metal to the core and redistribute that iron 3 plus and sort of homogenize the mantle again. Um, but this is a, a pretty difficult mechanism to try to quantify. Um, and there's actually you don't necessarily actually have to start crystallization in order to produce this iron 3 plus. You can actually probably do this just within the silicate melt before you start crystallizing. <coughs> so I wanted to try to quantify what, you, what the initial iron 3 plus value of the magma ocean might be. And so here's the disproportionation reaction again. This time I've written it so that's occurring in the silicate melt. <clears throat> and in order to calculate this, we need a model for the thermodynamics of this reaction. And in particular, what we need are the Gibbs energy for each of these components, uh, the partial molar volume, and activity coefficients for each of those uh, oxides. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and fortunately, there have been a couple of people working on doing the, determining some of these properties experimentally in just the last couple of years. Um, and these are experiments looking at the iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus ratio in different silicate melts as a function of pressure as you go up to higher pressure. Um, Mark Hirschman had suggested in a paper a few years ago, well, 2012, so that's, a, that's more than a few years now, that um, if you can stabilize iron 3 plus in high pressure mineral phases like perovskite, then you should be able to do it in the silicate melt as well. <coughs> and so that's what has led to these kinds of experiments. Uh, prior to these past uh, few years, um, this was as high as the measurements went. This is going up to about 3 gigapascals. 
Um, and now you can see that this published paper, Zhang et al. is going up to about seven gigapascals. And then this is some unpublished work from a couple of abstracts that I think is, it has been submitted now, hopefully, um, which is going up to about 20 gigapascals. And so what you can see happening in, particularly in this unpublished work, is you get a decrease in the iron three plus abundance as you go to higher pressures, as we saw in this lower pressure data. But once you get up to about 15 GPA, it sort of flattens out, and then it starts to increase as you go up to higher pressures. Um, so potentially, you can start to produce iron three plus at high pressures by reaction of silicate and metal during core formation. So I took this published data set and I refitted a couple of ways to try to get those pieces of, of thermodynamic data that I need to calculate the disproportionation reaction. And then I combine it with a metal silicate uh, equilibration model. So these are two reactions that are often used in core formation models to look at the abundance of uh, light elements in the core. And so what we have is metal reacting with silicate to put silicon in the metal, and we also put oxygen in the metal as well. <coughs> so this can influence the overall oxidation state of the mantle, as well as the core. Um, and then we combine that with this disproportionation reaction, um, which was supplementing with some data on liquid iron and some lower pressure data on the uh, silicate oxides. And so here's the results for the iron three plus abundance that we get as a function of pressure. So using data that it was only derived from one bar measurements, which is all we had prior to the past couple of years, uh, this is the um, production of iron three plus as a function of pressure. So you can see why people have been ignoring iron three plus in core formation models, because with this previous data, you get very, very small amounts of iron three plus at high pressures, so you can sort of ignore it. But with this new data uh, shown in these four fits that I've done, you can see it gives you, uh, these fits are not giving you exactly the same answer uh, because the data is still uh, at relatively low pressures. But what you can see is that all of these produce more iron three plus at high pressure than they do at low pressure. Um, from anything around one and a half percent up to 25 percent at sort of the average core forming conditions. This cur uh, sorry, this shaded region here is the amount of iron three plus you get in spinel peridotites uh, in the upper mantle. In this greenish cur uh, region is in garnet peridotites. So this spans sort of the upper mantle composition that we expect and that we have on the present day. So what this suggests is that we don't actually need any additional mechanism other than the core formation and equilibration between silicate and metal in order to, to produce the present day oxidation state of the Earth's mantle. Um, okay, and um, we took this a little bit further and looked also at partitioning of the iron three plus uh, relative to two plus as the magma ocean is crystallizing uh, using partition coefficients. And I'm gonna skip through this a little quickly because I think I'm running a little bit over. Um, so we're using partition coefficients to see how the oxidation state, once you have iron three plus there, how does it change as the magma ocean crystallizes? And so you can see that, that um, this is a simulation from Lindy Elkins Tanton, who's using sort of this realistic crystallization sequence and gets an uh, increase in iron oxide within the silicate melt as you crystallize the mantle. And so I wanted to add the iron three plus into that and see what happens. Um, I'm gonna skip over that. If you have questions, <laughs> let me know. Um, so here's what I've done is I've taken uh, partition coefficients for the iron three plus and plugged it into Lindy's model to look at how the iron three plus uh, to two plus ratio changes as you crystallize the mantle. And I'm starting at a fixed initial composition of either 1% or 5% iron, th uh, iron three plus initially. And you can see that um, these are for two different partitioning models. We're getting an, an increase in the iron three plus abundance uh, at just as a result of crystallization. It's not being produced, it's just being enhanced in the melt of a factor of about two to five. 
um, in the final magma ocean liquid. And so that has implications for the atmospheric composition uh, in contact with this magma ocean. This is just a simulation. Uh, I've taken that um, iron 3 plus evolution and used that to predict the oxygen fugacity and then uh, done a gas chemistry calculation. So uh, going from right to left, the iron 3 plus is increasing in the melt. Uh, this is starting with 1% or 5%. And you can see that we start off uh, in the 1% case with hydrogen. And then, then as we evolve the magma ocean, we get to more oxidized atmospheres. Uh, so in the 5% case, the atmosphere remains oxidized throughout its entire evolution. So understanding these processes is going to be important and understanding the initial composition of the atmosphere of a rocky planet like the Earth uh, after, a giant, uh, after a magma ocean stage. So uh, here's my summary. I'll just leave it up and let you read it. And just a quick plug, um, I am starting at Stanford uh, next year, and I am looking for grad students and postdocs. So if anybody is interested in working on these kinds of questions, you should have them get in touch with me. So I'll stop there, uh, and thank you guys. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's pretty indiscriminate. Um, it's, it's going to drive off the lighter elements faster. Um, um, I mean, it is basically a form of, of genes escape. Um, it's just in the hydrodynamic regime. So I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, if they're, uh, right, yeah, I mean, how, how basically would the presence of the solar nebula gas um, affect the molecules that get into the Earth? Um, that's, that's a good question. So that's something that people are, are working on now is trying to think about whether you can have ingassing of solar nebular gases into, uh, this would be a lot easier if the, if the mantle is molten um, in order to get to start dissolving gases from the solar nebula. Um, certainly, I think um, some of the noble gas data does suggest that there might be a solar component in the, in the Earth's mantle, but that could also be derived from uh, sort of implanted material that came in the, the solid material that was accreted, potentially. Um, so as far as looking at accretion of gas into the atmosphere, um, there has been, there was a, a recent paper out of a Japanese group that looked at sort of a hybrid atmosphere model where they took, they have outgassing coming into the bottom of the atmosphere and they have a solar nebula gas at the top. And they're doing this for Mars, not for the Earth. Um, and they found that does sort of, it does sort of prolong magma ocean lifetimes a little bit. Um, and so, so that's something that, that people are working on, but which I haven't done anything on directly. Yeah. So uh, I'm wondering about the role of an uh, intrinsic magnetic field in this, you know, lost atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Does that factor into these models at all, or do you just assume it's there or not there? No, no, I'm not including any kind of, of magnetic field. Um, uh, I think for the Earth, uh, my understanding is the magnetic field probably started a little bit later. It wasn't around, um, certainly during this magma ocean stage. Um, and also the influence of magnetic fields on atmospheric escape has become somewhat controversial because uh, we certainly see atmospheric escape from sort of polar regions on the Earth, and that's possibly being driven by the magnetic field itself, so bringing ionic material. Uh, ions in. Um, so 
so I know people are <laughs> working on that again for for the Earth, um, but I think this um, there are definitely people working on influence of magnetic field, and particularly with solar wind stripping of of planets for for exoplanets. People have done a couple of models of that, um, but the rates of those tend to be quite a bit lower as far as atmospheric escape than the XUV driven escape is. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, well, um, uh, so there, there is the possibility for observing probably some of these hotter planets um, and looking for signatures of, say, atmospheric escape of hydrogen from, from some of these planets like GJ1132b. So that, might, that planet might be a good target for James Webb. Um, and looking at whether it does have a, a water atmosphere remaining. There have been some uh, ground-based observations that suggest it does have an atmosphere, but um, detecting water in the atmosphere of an exoplanet from the ground is probably hard. Uh, so James Webb would probably be a lot better at that. Um, and then, I mean, I think we really need to, particularly before we get to the next stage of, of a space telescope beyond James Webb, we really need to start nailing down things like the abiotic oxygen buildup and the um, other possible false positives that are being created just by tectonics, planetary weathering, outgassing, and things like that. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, let's 